everyone, this video is a follow-up video based on a previous video wherein I discussed the feminine essence theory. In this video, I want to address one specific variation of this theory, which has been dubbed the brain sex theory. The feminine essence theory is a philosophical theory that seeks to explain the phenomenon of human transsexualism. The theory states that transgender people are quite literally trapped inside the wrong body. This is not just a figurative way of speaking, but this is true in the most literal sense. The physical body is believed not to reflect one's true self. The true self is what's on the inside. This is the so-called feminine essence. The feminine essence can be understood as a female soul, a female identity, a female personality, a female mind or spirit, or a certain feeling. In the case of the brain sex theory, the feminine essence is conceptualized as a female brain structure or brain chemistry. Male to female transsexuals are understood as persons with a male body, yet a female brain. The reverse would be true for female to male transsexuals. In this video, I will explain why I don't believe this theory is true by identifying some obvious flaws. I will show you multiple research papers, which you can read by pausing the video. The description box will also contain references to all the mentioned studies. The general presupposition of the brain sex theory is that the human brain is a sexually differentiated organ that fully accounts for one's gender identity, by which I mean the psychological conception of the self as male or female. The so-called brain sex is thought to be present from birth as well. In other words, while male to female transsexuals are phenotypically male, they were always female where it is believed to truly count. The sex of the brain is believed to be the result of hormonal influences in utero, genetics, epigenetics or a combination thereof. In other words, the brain sex is determined by biological factors only. This simply cannot be true for the mere fact that concordance of transgender identity in identical twins is not 100%. Despite identical twins sharing the same DNA and having shared the same in neutral environment. Thus, we can conclude that there most likely are other non biological factors that also account for transgender identity. The concordance rate for transgender identity in identical twins lies anywhere between roughly 10 and 30 percent, depending on which study you read. Many proponents of the brain sex theory also believe one's brain sex is both unchangeable and fully responsible for the development of gender dysphoria. Consequently, gender dysphoria is believed to last a lifetime. In other words, it is impossible to cure gender dysphoria, unlike other psychiatric disorders such as depression or anorexia. This view simply isn't supported by the scientific literature. Both older and newer studies indicate the majority of gender dysphoric children do not remain gender dysphoric in adolescence or adulthood. Persistence rates vary from 2 to 27 percent depending on which study you read. As discussed before, proponents of the brain sex theory believe one's brain sex cannot be changed. A mismatched brain sex will inevitably lead to the development of gender dysphoria as well. Therefore, gender dysphoria cannot be cured. The only possible cure is a physical transition via cross-sex hormonal therapy and surgeries. In other words, the brain sex cannot be changed to match the body, but the reverse is true. The body can be cosmetically changed to match the brain. Proponents believe every gender dysphoric person suffers from an incongruence between the brain and the body. As such, every gender dysphoric person would benefit from a physical transition. A transition will align the body with the brain and thus relieve feelings of gender dysphoria. Once again, the scientific literature doesn't support this view. It is reported that there are people who regret their transition or parts thereof. It is not exactly known what percentage of patients have regrets, given that follow-up studies always exclude a minority of patients whom the researchers felt to contact, it is conceivable that it is precisely those people who cope with feelings of regret, not to mention that most follow-up studies are short-term, not long-term. When confronted with studies that go against the brain sex theory, proponents usually resort to what I call the true trans versus transgender dichotomy. The idea is that children who outgrow their gender dysphoria are not really transgender, Likewise, people who regret part of their transition are not really transgender either. People who manage to relieve their gender dysphoria via therapy only are not truly transgender. You get the idea. It is argued these people are instead transgenders, people who mistakenly think they are transgender when they're not. Sometimes they're painted as morons who unjustly take up resources from the true transgenders. 
Other times they're painted as people who had other mental health issues that they mistook for gender dysphoria. For example, body dysmorphic disorder or an eating disorder. Either way, it is argued that the transgenders do not genuinely suffer from gender dysphoria. This is a logical fallacy known as the no true Scotsman fallacy, which is also called appeal to purity. The logical fallacy is rooted in the fact that counter examples are dismissed to protect the generalization. It goes a little something like this. If you have gender dysphoria, you are transgender, and gender dysphoria cannot be overcome without physical transition. Well, there are gender dysphoric children who outgrow their gender dysphoria. Likewise, some gender dysphorics manage their dysphoria with therapy only, and not physical transition. On top of that, some gender dysphorics do not benefit from physical transition, but no true transgender person can manage their dysphoria without transition. The people you mentioned are the transgenders who don't have gender dysphoria at all. Aside from this being illogical, I think it is also a potentially dangerous view. This view is used to justify puberty blockers for gender dysphoric children, and it is used to dismiss the benefits of therapy. On top of that, it is used to coerce people into physical transition, as people in transgender communities are told this is the only way to solve their problems with dysphoria. Some even go as far as to say your only options are either physical transition or suicide. This all stems from the idea that gender dysphoria, unlike other psychiatric disorders, is somehow innate, unchangeable, incurable, or 100% biologically determined when the scientific literature simply doesn't support this viewpoint. This view magically doesn't apply to other psychiatric disorders, for example chronic depression. If a chronically depressed person doesn't benefit from antidepressant medication, does that mean she is not truly depressed after all? Why is gender dysphoria the expression of a true self, yet the same is not true for other mental disorders? As stated before, those who believe in the brain sex theory believe gender dysphoria has a neurological cause, which is thought to be the sole cause of the disorder. As such, proponents oftentimes claim that gender dysphoria is either a neurological disorder or a neuropsychiatric disorder, despite gender dysphoric patients showing no neurological symptoms. That means the brain of a gender dysphoric person must show abnormalities in terms of structure or chemistry. Not only that, the abnormality lies within the fact that it resembles a typical structure or chemistry found in members of the opposite sex. Proponents tend to have a hard time specifying what this exact abnormality is. Sometimes they refer to percentages of white and grey matter, other times to the neural density of certain parts of the brain, and other times to the coordination between the left and right hemispheres. It is not truly explained how this leads to the development of gender dysphoria. The closest thing to an explanation is that the brain expects to see a physical body of the opposite sex. It is thought that the brain has a blueprint or map of the body that doesn't correlate with the actual physical reality. Sometimes this is compared to phantom limbs, but proponents fail to understand phantom limbs only occur in people who have lost a limb, not in people who were born without a limb. Phantom limbs don't even occur in every single patient whose limbs had to be amputated. Even when they do, the pain typically lasts a few years and not forever. They can also be successfully treated. In regards to the body map, there are indeed neurological networks involved in self-referential processes and own body perception. I found one study where in female to males, as well as heterosexual female and heterosexual male control groups, were exposed to morphed images of their own body. The researchers used MRI techniques to compare functional connections within these body map networks. While the female to males do differ from the control groups, the control groups did not differ from each other. These studies suggest that while there are neurological abnormalities in gender dysphoric individuals, these abnormalities are not a sign of cross-sex sexual differentiation. Even then, the study acknowledges it cannot draw any conclusions in regards to the etiology of gender dysphoria. In other words, while the absorbed disconnections could cause a troubled self-identity, it could also be the case that troubled self-identity over time leads to the observed disconnections. Brain structure after all changes over time, even in adults, based on your lived experiences. This is called neuroplasticity. Proponents of the brain sex theory, however, seem to suggest that brain structure is sexually differentiated as well as fixed, meaning that the sex of the brain cannot change over time. This contradicts what we know about brain structure. 
Proponents of the blame sex theory seem to imply gender dysphoria is the result of biological factors only and thus ignore all psychosocial factors related to the development of gender dysphoria. However, the scientific literature once again doesn't support this view. The literature suggests a biopsychosocial perspective. For starters, it is well documented that homosexuality and bisexuality are much more common in the gender dysphoric population than in the general population. On top of that, gender dysphoric people also report high percentages of child abuse, including sexual abuse. It is also worth noting that gender dysphoric children tend to come from broken homes. Lastly, in recent years, there has been greater attention for the comorbidity between gender dysphoria and autism spectrum disorder. The traditional view of sexually dimorphic brain stems from the idea that genetic sex determines gonadal sex and it is the hormones secreted by the gonads that induce sexual dimorphism in the brain. Most neurological studies that focus on sex differentiation thus focus on brain regions involved in sexual reproduction. Proponents of the brain sex theory, however, seem to suggest one specific feature or part of the brain is sexually dimorphic and responsible for gender identity. Multiple different features, regions and characteristics have been proposed as the gender identity establisher. This facet of the brain is generally thought to be sexually differentiated due to gonadal hormonal influences in utero, albeit not due to gonadal hormones produced by the gonads. Rather, it must be gonadal hormones the fetus receives from the mother and or gonadal hormones synthesized locally in the brain of the fetus. Proponents of the brain sex theory tend to have an oversimplified understanding of brain development in relation to gonadal hormones. A lot have suggested that testosterone equals more male, while estradiol equals more female. I don't think most are aware of the fact that testosterone can act via androgen receptors as well as via estrogen receptors. This is because testosterone can be converted to estradiol by an enzyme called aromatase. As said before, sometimes proponents believe the brain is only sexually differentiated in a few particular regions. Other times they seem to imply the brain as a whole is sexually dimorphic. This implies all cisgender females and all male to females share a type of brain that is distinct from the type shared by all cisgender males and all female to males. However, newer research suggests individual brains can vary a lot from one another, even between persons of the same sex. Not only that, one individual can have both male and female parts, thus creating a mosaic of relative male and femaleness. As such, the brain is not male or female as a whole, rather individual brain regions display relative male or femaleness. I have oftentimes wondered why the brain sex theory seems so plausible to so many people within transgender circles. As said before, this theory is not entirely novel in the sense that it is simply the newest iteration of the feminine essence theory, which has been around since the 1800s, if I'm not mistaken. All the variations are based on the idea of a female or male soul trapped inside the wrong body. Western society has become less and less religious over time, so the theory had to be reinvented as to make it more palatable to a modern zeitgeist. On top of that, fields such as psychology and sociology are taken less seriously than STEM fields are, and the brain sex theory is based on the position of neurology, not psychology or sociology, can best explain gender dysphoria. Proponents of the brain sex theory claim to base their beliefs on science and science alone, much like neo-atheists. However, I don't think all the reversions of the feminine essence theory have entirely disappeared. While doing research for this video, I came across a paper that discussed gender dysphoria in children. A young gender dysphoric girl claimed she wanted to die so she would be reborn as a boy. The girl was from a Buddhist family and Buddhists believe in the concept of reincarnation. In general, it is useful to study gender dysphoria in individuals from non-Western cultures, as people from non-Western backgrounds may have entirely different philosophical beliefs about the ideology of gender dysphoria. I think gender dysphoric people in general feel compelled to adhere to at least one version of the feminescence theory because it is somewhat inherent to gender dysphoria. The DSM-5 states the following diagnostic criterion for gender dysphoria in adolescents and adults. A strong conviction that one has the typical feelings and reactions of the other gender, or some alternative gender different from one's assigned gender. In other words, gender dysphoric people tend to believe in something that connects them to people of the opposite sex. 
This something can be a soul, a feeling, a personality, or a brain structure. The idea is that transgender people have the true inner experience of someone of the opposite sex. However, there is no scientific basis for this belief. There is no such thing as feeling like a woman or a man, or thinking like a woman or a man. I find these suggestions somewhat ridiculous and in some ways also rather sexist. Having said that, I will end the video right here. I am planning on making more content in the near future, so please hit the subscribe button. Bye!